Welcome back to the show. Well, this week we are picking up our conversation with the Honorable Preston Manning, known as the father of modern day conservatism in Canada and a true voice of wisdom for our time. Last week, we talked about his personal journey into political service as an elected official. We talked about Western alienation in Canada and also edged into the conversation around faith and the public square and reviving principled politics in Canada. This week, we're picking up that very conversation and also touching on things such as environmental policy, wealth creation, the federal deficit and debt, the future of politics in Canada, and what the average Canadian can do to make a real tangible difference. But first, a few clips from last week's conversation. Let's get to it. You can use the tools that democracy gives to everybody to change the direction of your country. Central Canada and Atlantic Canada don't understand what these Western aspirations are. They are actually in the best interest of the country as a whole. One of the dangers I see in the political arena is this polarization of politics on virtually every issue. Now let's talk for a moment about a, a true conservative option in our nation. We've been seeing the Conservative Party at their own admission, you know, moving more and more, and not just to the centre, but to the left. More and more Conservatives are feeling like they have no home in, in the political spectrum. Then you see parties, for example, like the PPC emerging. How important is it that the current Conservative expression in the Federal Conservative Party um, reclaims some of the right on the political spectrum in, in terms of their own even um, future and viability? Well, I, I think that is important. Uh, instead of just sort of compromising and trying to find some mushy middle that's got a little bit of this and a little bit of that, to, to, to crusade on this idea of the need for, for, for balance, and, and balance as a principle, not balance as a political tactic. I think that's one way that can restore some uh, principled basis to the, uh, the the Conservative Party. I, I'd also note with younger people, uh, I mean, uh, my generation particularly, and less yours, but th this conceptualizing politics as left, right, center, uh, why do we continue to do that? Th th that comes from, that left, right, center conceptualization of politics comes from the French Revolution. <laughs> the, the, the landowners sat on the right and the, and the socialists sat on the left. And that's, why are we still dividing the political world up that way? And uh, several years ago, we put on some receptions for millennials at the center that we had in Calgary. Uh, uh, and... Uh, because we, in talking to millennials, we found a lot of them said, well, I don't agree with this left, right, center. I'm sort of left on this and right on that. I, it doesn't mean anything to me. So I end up in a mushy kind of middle that's not represented by anybody. So we put on these uh, receptions and we invited people to come and we had posters on the wall of some different framework for conceptualizing politics. We had one on uh, environment. Are, are you in favor of the state being the major instrument for environmental protection? Or do you think there's a role for entrepreneurship and market mechanisms, et cetera. Where are you on that axis with respect to democracy? Or are you in favor of small numbers of expert people with executive power making the major decisions? Or do you think you should involve large numbers of people making the decisions? Where are you on that? And it was interesting that these younger people said they could position themselves on those axes a lot better than they could on the left, right, center. So I think one of the things, not just for conservatives, but for democratic politics or politicians uh, of any stripe is to, to get out of that left, right, center conceptualization of politics and, and find some other principled basis for appealing to people, particularly to younger people for whom that old framework doesn't make any sense. Insightful point. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, a little bit more about solution orientation within the conservative movement. I know you've been a real voice for the need for the conservative movement to have strong alternatives for the environment and for protecting the environment um, and, and poverty, some of these different things. Can you talk about the importance of the conservative movement in Canada um, being innovative and solution oriented on some of these types of issues? Well, I, th I think conservatives or anybody in the political arena has to address some of these big issues. And I, I believe that conservatives can offer principled solutions that are fundamentally different than what's being offered by the the other people. On the uh, 
on the environment. Uh, you can harness market mechanisms, pricing mechanisms to deal with environmental protection. And I think they actually can be more effective than the state becoming the only instrument and government regulation being the only instrument to uh, to cope with the environment. The uh, with respect to poverty, which you know everyone should be concerned about, we've tried for whatever it is, fifty years, seventy years to cope with poverty through uh, income redistribution through progressive taxation. Take some money from people that got it and give it to people that don't. This has been tried, and how well has it worked? You can go to any poor area of Western Canada or any part of Canada and ask people, has this worked? That's been the prevailing philosophy, particularly on the part of liberals and, uh, and uh, social democrats, and it doesn't work. Another approach is to have a better distribution of the tools of wealth creation as distinct from just redistributing income. Uh, providing people in poorer areas with uh, access to markets, with access to capital. Microcapital is one of the mechanisms that's been used with uh, uh, technology that can be applied even in uh, at a very low cost in, in poor areas. Give people the tools of wealth creation as distinct from redistributing income. Is that not a more conservative approach and one that's different than what the other people are offering? I know you come from a part of Alberta that uh, North Central Alberta it was a, one of the poorer areas of that uh, province. And uh, we got involved with some people in that area that set up a community development company, but it had two objectives, not one. One was to earn a return on the capital that it was invested. So it was a capitalist organization but the second was to undertake projects that would deliver a social benefit to the community as well as a financial benefit they started with a housing project in lesser slave lake there was no rental housing there and then it gradually built out and built out and got did work and with the oil companies and other people changed the name of it to make it broader than the original thing and uh, 50 year 45 years later they, they had about 300 shareholders all local people including the sawridge uh, indian band from the town and, and 40 50 years later originally they sold shares at a dollar a share it took them 18 months to raise a hundred thousand dollars because people didn't know what this was and why would i buy these shares and how would i do it but anyway 45 50 years later they sold that whole company uh for 55 million dollars and redistributed that back now now that that was an illustration of trying to uh, uh, deal with poverty through giving people the tools of wealth creation as distinct from just redistributing somebody else's income I'm finding this so fascinating and so encouraging. And obviously, I, I know that area of our nation very, very well. So it's such an inspiring story I was totally unaware of. But let's talk, though, about this financial issue. Something I'm passionate about, I know you're passionate about, is leaving a legacy for future generations rather than a burden of debt on a variety of frontiers, but finances, you know, going into the pandemic, the average Canadian's debt burden, federal, provincial combined, was about thirty thousand. Now we're looking at somewhere between fifty and sixty thousand dollars that every Canadian owes on the federal and provincial debt portions. Mr. Manning, <laughs> if your grandson was the Prime Minister of Canada, you know what would be your advice to the current leadership in terms of how to dig our, ourselves out of this hole? and set the next generations up um, for prosperity rather than massive taxation because of the debt burden? Well, th again, this is not an easy question to, well, it's easy to say things that would be an answer, but to actually do them is, uh, is different. But I think a starting point is to get political people and voters have to have this in their heads to start with to recognize that this balancing of budget and here's this word balance coming in again it is absolutely essential if you want to maintain the integrity the financial integrity of the state and of your economy that somebody has to do it and the difference is i we crusaded on this in the 80s, the, the federal budget, uh, even under conservatives, let alone under liberals, got up to the deficit got up to $50 billion, which was unheard of in those days. But it, even in those days, even the liberals would agree that we, we've got to do something about it. It can't keep going like this. 
Yes, it's a problem. Now, the way they disagreed with us is say, you guys are going too fast or you're doing it the wrong way. But they didn't disagree that the budget ultimately had to be balanced. Today, you, you have liberals particularly and social democrats in Ottawa who don't acknowledge that that the deficit is a problem or that the debt is a problem. Do not even acknowledge it as a problem. And you're never going to get a solution if you don't acknowledge that you've got a problem in the first place. So I think a starting place is to convince Canadians, again, when the politician knocks on your door and has, you know, all sorts of nice flattering things to say to you, excuse me, I want to know, are you or are you not in favor of balancing the federal budget? And where is the program for doing that in your party's platform? If you have one, I might consider voting for you. If you do not, or if you deny that this is a problem, you're the last person that would get my vote. And then uh, I, I think, secondly, the, this uh, to, to come to grips with the overspending, th this idea that every time there's a problem, the only answer to it is some government action and some government expenditure, that that, that, that has to be knocked out of the heads of people. That a lot of these problems, yes, the government can play a role, but it can't be the sole answer. And it financing its a pro, another program to deal with that will just add to this deficit and debt. Th those are two kind of fundamental uh, attitudinal changes I think that have to happen before you're actually going to be able to come to grips with the uh, with the deficit and, and the debt. How to introduce an issue that's particularly got moral and ethical dimensions in a society that's completely hostile to the subject. We love Canada, and we want to see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit fayteen.tv or call one 866 844-0844 to donate today. Mr. Manning, one of the things that you often talk about is the legacy of William Wilberforce. And here's a man out of a, a motivation of his faith, gets involved in uh, politics, uh, takes up the cause to end the slave trade, and after 50 years uh, is able to execute. For Canadians today watching this, what are some of the lessons that we can learn from Wilberforce's story? The, the classic issue campaign that people ought to study is that campaign conducted by William Wilberforce and his colleagues to try to get slavery abolished within the British Empire. And uh, one of the guidelines that Jesus gave to his original gang before he sent them out to do any public work was this, uh, be, be wise as a serpent and gracious as a dove. And and that campaign conducted by Wilberforce uh, illustrated a lot of that, both that wisdom and that graciousness. But ju just some of the uh, some of the lessons from it. Uh, uh, often, if it's a moral issue, <clears throat> people who feel strongly about it, let's say people of faith, want to ride into the political arena, ride into the House of Commons on a white horse, brandishing their sword and denouncing the evil that they're trying to eliminate <laughs> and, and denouncing anybody connected with it and say, why don't we immediately do something about it? And uh, the interesting thing about Wilberforce had a, a, a colleague, or William Pitt, who was actually the prime minister. These were young people at that time. Pitt became prime minister at the age of 24. Wilberforce, I think, was 22. And Pitt was shrewd as the devil. He, he didn't particularly share Wilberforce's faith, but he was shrewd. And I think he said to Wilberforce, if you ride into the House of Commons, like the, the, you, in that day, you couldn't discuss slavery in the British House of Commons, particularly in the House of Lords, uh, partly because a lot of those people were benefit. They weren't slave owners, but they were benefiting from the slave trade and its benefits to England. And, and Pitt said, you ride into the House of Commons crusading like that, and that subject will then not be discussed for another 20 years. So how do you introduce this moral subject, like abortion might be today, that is considered taboo? You can't talk about that here. Well, uh, Wilberforce framed this resolution. I actually have a copy of it somewhere. That this house give consideration to 
the circumstances surrounding, you didn't, didn't even talk about slavery, you talked about the slave trade, that this house give consideration to the circumstances. You can just see his more zealous colleagues saying, what kind of a mealy mouse <laughs> resolution is that? But he managed to get that to legitimate the discussion of a taboo subject in an electoral arena or, or in a political arena where it was taboo before. That, that, that was just a, one lesson from that campaign, how to introduce uh, an issue that's particularly got moral and ethical dimensions in a secular society or in a society that's completely hostile to the subject. So his, uh, the, and then the, the other thing, he, uh, slaves were considered property in, the, in that day. And as long as it was debated on what, what are you going to do with this property? Are you going to free it? And if you're going to free it, who, how are you going to compensate it? You, you didn't get, get anywhere. Uh, it, Wilberforce put the emphasis on the, these are human beings. Uh, and this was actually a radical concept at that time. These are, these are human beings who are suffering. Uh, he, and he made a big point of the suffering. They, they, they got the chains that were used to sh shackle the slaves on the slave ships and they brought them into the House of Commons. They, what, what if these were on you? And, and he, he used the suffering angle and the humanity of the slaves as distinct from them being an economic entity, which is how they, they, the slavery had been conceptualized basically from a standpoint of public policy. So there, there was, there's about 15 different tactics and things that they used that uh, are as relevant today. They invented the idea of the boycott. They started to boycott sugar from the West Indies because it had been produced on slave uh, plantations. They, they, they invented a lot of the uh, uh, techniques that are used in issue campaigns today were developed in that campaign. So study Studying issue campaigns, and particularly ones like that, particularly from people of faith, because that, that had the interface between faith and politics. It was basically driven by uh, evangelical Christians. Uh, there's a lot to be learned for how to conduct issue campaigns today. Wow, so powerful and profound. Thank you for that. One of your passions is getting people, helping people on ramp into the civic process, into politics. So let's talk about that for a moment. If someone really wants to make an impact on the future of our nation and they feel called to the political realm, where do they start? Well, I, I think one starting place is to acknowledge that you, you need some preparation and training to get there and uh, and to make some effort to to acquire some of the skills and knowledge that you need to not just to get elected but the, the more important thing is to know what to do once you do get elected so uh, I, i've been a big advocate like to become a the barista at starbucks you, you need at least 15 hours of training to know the difference between a a mocha and a latte, but you can become a lawmaker in the Parliament of Canada or in a legislature without one hour of training in lawmaking or without one hour of training in public finance, without one hour of training in the relationship between science and public policy. And uh, what I uh, urge a lot of younger people to do is get, get some training and expertise before you get there rather than try to learn on the job. And uh, I've been involved in trying to set up some programs that would help do this. There, there's one at Carleton University, a graduate program in political management. Uh, it was financed by uh, Clay Riddell, an oil patch guy from Calgary. And it, it's one way of getting some advanced training in that area. The uh, University of British Columbia has this uh, um, pro, a summer school program for future legislators, the Institute for Future Legislators. And there's other programs as well. So I, I try to encourage people to get some training and preparation before you get into the into the arena. As we're talking some some big issues here, you know, Western alienation, unity, uh, civil liberties. We've touched upon that a little bit. Um, but to the person that's watching this right now, who's just saying, "Listen, there's just there is no point in me even getting involved. This is on this is a, a train on a, a tra fast trajectory to wreckage, and I'm just gonna um, love my babies and try to enjoy life as much as I can. But I'm not really gonna get involved." What do you say to that person who feels a little bit defeatist, and maybe point them to some of the the pointers that you emphasize in your amazing book, 365 Ways to Do Something? to build a better Canada for the future? 
Well, I, I acquaint people with what I call the iron law of democratic politics. If you choose to not involve yourself in the politics of your country, you will be governed by those who do. Now, if you don't like what those who do are doing now, your only alternative is to get involved in some way, shape, or form. And you say, I've got that book on Do, do Something. Uh, I make a big point of, the, yes, there's the political parties, and you, you can get involved with a, a, a political party. And it's, it's, it's one of the freedoms that we do have. But I, I, on the conservative side, I distinguish between the parties and, and what I call the conservative movement. The, the, if you think of a pyramid, the par parties of the elected people are at the top of that. But there, there are think tanks that develop ideas. There are advocacy groups that push particular ideas. There are communicators, communicators like yourself, programs that endeavor to get the issues out and clarify them. There's uh, financial donations that have to be made to all of these things. Like, p pick one of those layers or one of those areas and and be involved in some way, maybe even just as a member, maybe just as writing a, a letter or an email or making a small contribution, but become involved in one way, shape or form in the instruments that are available to, to all of us. And uh, I go back to our reform uh, uh, exercise. That started with five people that couldn't even agree on a lot of things, but could agree on one thing. And it ended up leading to a, a formation of a majority government. So these, these, these small activities can be harnessed to achieve big results. Yes, absolutely. And a few people really can make a huge difference. You know, I've been involved in so many campaigns. Personally, I'm sure you could uh, line the rest of our interview here with stories of campaigns that have been won or lost by a few dozen votes or less than 100 votes. Well, or on that subject, uh, in the 1993 election, <clears throat> reform lost three seats in Edmonton by a total of 324 votes. The fact that we didn't get those seats meant that the official opposition in Ottawa was the, was the Bloc Québécois, a party committed to secession. They became the official opposition instead of a Federalist party. And, and the, the Bloc, with their friends in Quebec and the PQ, in that referendum on whether to break up the country or not, th th they came within a hair of winning that referendum. And I was going to say that if that referendum had gone the other way and the country had broken up, Quebec had seceded, I was going to go back to Edmonton and say there are 325 people here who, if voted a different way or got out and voted, would have made the difference. But as it was a result, the, the a separatist party became the official opposition and used that platform to promote uh, Quebec secession like uh, they, they never could have if, if they'd been the third party. So th this business of my vote doesn't count or what difference does it make? Yes, you never know what your vote make, how much it may count, which is just another reason for, for, for taking it seriously. That's so eye-opening. Thank you for sharing that story. So in our final moments here, the Honorable Preston Manny, and this has been such a treat, such a delight. I know this is going to be an interview that myself and my husband will watch over and over again, share with our children. Uh, any final words for the nation of Canada, for those that are watching here, 2021, where do we go as a nation? How to, do we move our nation forward in, in times like these? Well, uh, I, I tell people that we should very much appreciate what we, we do ha have here. I know a lot of people take it for granted. We're the second largest country by land mass on the face of the earth, which just happens to mean we have the second largest store of natural resources on the face of the earth. Uh, we do have a, a democratic tradition. Yes, it's got all kinds of flaws in it, but uh, it's enabled people like myself and my colleagues to... To, to make some major changes starting from a very humble uh, base. So I would tell people to appreciate what we have here economically, what we have politically, what we have democratically, and then to participate in one way, shape or form in, in trying to influence the future.
Well, I think what you just said there is do something <laughs> and stay optimistic and hope filled and believe big. All you got to list off all the books that, that you have right now. You have so many resources, you know, the, the Manning Center that you started that has actually morphed now into the Strong and Free Network, the Western Story. Uh, where can people find you and where can they access your incredible resources, the many well, books that you've written? The Canada Strong and Free Network is, is uh, we hand it off. A lot of the work that was done in the by the Manning Center to that organization. It's headed up by uh, Troy Lanigan. It used to be the uh, president of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, and and he convenes these regular uh, online forums where we're trying to get people who are uh, working in their own little silo to know what other people are doing, so that they can interconnect and advance some of the ideas that we've talked about uh, here today. Uh, on this theme of Western alienation or Western aspirations, which is important, people outside the West uh, uh, as well to become better acquainted with, it. there is a, a website, thewesternstory.ca, where those podcasts can be uh, uh, can be viewed. And uh, so there are various, you know, th 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 those are ways of being in touch with some of the things that we're doing that uh, hopefully people can uh, take advantage of and it will resonate with them. Thank you so much for that. And again, the Honorable Preston Manning, we are so grateful to you for your legacy in, po in politics, your political legacy, uh, but particularly for the continued quest to raise up future leaders with integrity, with principled politics, and those that can serve our nation That's in a good spirit of, you of to say. Uh, One little last story that might amuse some of your viewers. Uh, my father... Uh, used to caution politicians that were getting ready to retire to, to not think about their legacy too much, uh, particularly while they were still in office, because he said, that's like driving the car, looking in the rearview mirror, and you're likely to run into a tree, and that will be your legacy. So <laughs> I, 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 legacies are important, but I think what's most important, for particularly for your viewers, and that is to build for the future. Let's build for the future and let history determine what our a legacy is or is not. Well, we appreciate those words and we appreciate your leadership and thank you so much for your generosity and your, your time today. The Honorable Preston Manning. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in this week for this insightful conversation with the Honorable Preston Manning. If you would like to watch this show again or the first part of the interview or any of our other previous programs, there are several ways that you can do that. Simply go to fateen.tv where this show is posted along with other previous episodes for your viewing convenience as well. We also wanted you to know that we have a free smartphone app that you can download to your phone and get alerts every single week when new shows are posted. You can also sign up for our email list at fateen.tv to get notices as well so that you never miss a show or an important announcement. That's one of the best ways to stay connected with our work. Thanks also for your support. We know that many of you know that we are a nonprofit media production that exists because of the generous contributions of people like you who value these conversations. So if you'd like to sign up to become a monthly partner or give a special donation today to help keep us on air, we deeply appreciate it, and we want you to know that every gift truly does make a real difference. Simply call one 844 and our team would be happy to serve you in any way that we can. Thanks again for joining me, and we hope to see you next week.